Hey there, fellow frustrated DMs and players. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And sometimes, no matter how many clues you lay down the path, the players just stumble and trip the whole way. So today we're talking about what happens when your players just don't get it on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by Tabletop Loot. We've been working with Tabletop Loot for years now. They were our first Twitch sponsor there when we founded the channel. If you've met us at a convention and gotten dice from us, Tabletop Loot made them. These are awesome people who make great stuff and they're finally doing their first dice Kickstarter. Every design is inspired by Hubble Photography. They're handmade and finished, they got sharp edges, clean look, and unlike most dice Kickstarters, there's no stretch goals or add-on only sets. They funded in two hours, and they've been at this for years. These dice are awesome. Check them out. Link in the comments and description. The Dungeon Master ultimately is the character's eyes and ears and nose and, and sense of taste and feel and all that other kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. They do. Players do not get information without the Dungeon Master giving it to them. And so, uh, sort of corollary to that is that things that are obvious for the characters need to be made explicit for the players right mm -hmm. like don't assume that that you know you, that they're going to make the same connections between things that their characters would but that as players they're not because they didn't read the lore bible or they've more likely had like a lot of life to live between the last time you guys played and and are not as invested yet yet yeah in in what's going on and so making sure that you are generous with information, generous with your descriptions without being like TMI. There is a point at which you're just like, wait a minute, that was too much. So being concise, but comprehensive is what we're looking for here. Making sure that yeah. uh, you're not flooding them with too much, but you are giving them more than enough. Kind of a mm -hmm. balance. <laughs> right. But yeah, it's... It's a balance, but I think one one place that D that uh, DMs GMs can um, kind of put a put an exclamation point on that is between sessions. Like you said, we have life to live. So when you're doing your recap, a you should do a recap when they come back to the next session, and b if they found those clues. That's when you remind them of those clues in the recap, whether it's ex like by and by putting it in there, you are making it explicit. You are reminding them of very specific pieces of information that you need, you know, yeah. um, in order to continue this investigation. It's the previously on. You wouldn't show them in the yes. previously on if it wasn't pertinent to what's about to happen, right? Yeah, there's a there's a reason why weekly serialized TV as the previous. Oh, yeah. To remind the viewers what happened. Because they might be like, wait, what is this? And it's the same with your players, yeah. as you're saying. You know, yeah, definitely. Let's actually go through and talk about like the types of clues and and sort mm -hmm. of like both how they might be found and also you know what they might have. Um, so this might seem obvious to everybody, but I think it's worth stating that the point of a clue is to provide information about who, what, when, where, and why, and how. Six things, yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. This thing happened. You got it. If it doesn't answer one of those questions, then it's not a clue that you want to give the players because you don't know if they're going to run with that one and wildly speculate. And then you're going to have to go, wait a minute, guys, that was not like <laughs> that, that was not. Well, I, I will say thing. maybe there is one cat, maybe there's one caveat to that. Mm -hmm. If you have a bad guy who wants to throw in a red herring clue specifically to throw the players off, but yeah. there needs to be an obvious resolution to that clue that points to the fact that they have arrived at a red herring. Certainly. It does not, it does not need to be so obfuscated in the details that it's like an errant bit of information that can just consistently throw them off because they're still calculating it. It needs yep. to be like, oh, wait. There's this footprint, so obviously it was a dragon kin, and then you get and it's like, wait, no, there's literally none of that around here. Wait a minute, right. somebody's wait. trying to throw us off. Yes, like, yes, yes. You yes, need yes. to uh, be able to arrive at that if they do go with it. Yeah, but yeah. that then provides more clues back to the main trail. Yep. Yeah, and it's a good technique for like later on in the investigation, like once they already have some information built up. 
if something oh, seems yeah. incongruous, then they, that, that might make them go like, wait a minute, we need to verify this because this seems out of place, which then also opens the door that you introduce something that seems out of place, but it's actually related, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So it's the big thing, apart from your excellent point uh, about <laughs> making it obvious when it's red herring is like to use it sparingly. Uh, it is a spice oh, that's yeah. nice. It really, it'll really kick it up, but it's something you want to not overdo it with. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that spice must not flow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in terms of uh, types of clues, there's obvious clues. These mm-hmm. are hidden in plain sight, easily seen. At worst, you have to have some sort of passive perception or awareness or investigation. Uh, but I'm not sure I would even do that. These are the ones that's like, that's a blood splatter on the wall. <laughs> you know, there's a broken window on right. the inside of the house. You know, I mean, yeah. 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 You just give exactly uh, the information. There's no role. There's no nothing. It's anybody could have found it. Now, what's the significance of it? That's another story. Um, building off of that, there are hidden clues. These require you to search. They're very specific to the location. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll we'll get into whether or not they you should roll or just give them the information here in a minute, but something has to be done specifically to find this hidden clue. Uh, and then the question is, is why is it hidden? Did someone do this deliberately? Is this perhaps an accident? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, next up are cryptic clues. Their location and meaning are hidden. Uh, classic one is like a code or a cipher or something, right? Like maybe it's Mm -hmm. hidden in a secret compartment, but then it's also like, what is this? (laughs) Uh, These can be big ones. Or the way, these can be like shows. Yeah. Or the way that, or the way someone is killed. If it's a murder mystery, like the exact methodology of how they're killed could itself be a cryptic clue. They're stabbed so many times in a certain area. And once you look at it, you realize that it's, you know, Oh my God, if you put this on the map of the city, that's where each person, you know, like something like right, that. Right. Something ritualistic um, or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. This, this is the place to get weird, right? Like you can use like ritualistic or symbolic uh, elements here in your clues. And, and like mm-hmm. I, I butted in was like the, the initial mystery might be, uh, we don't know where this person is. And then it then is revealed, Oh wait, they were killed or something you know and then the mystery Mm -hmm. deepens um the uh uh, another type of clue is forensic Uh, this is a clue that is revealed through specialized training and time right this is a classic like csi shit right like (laughs) you know you're gonna take it back to the lab do a thing and in like fantasy Mm -hmm. games to me this is where like magic really comes in you know we're gonna do some alchemy on this thing we're going to contact some some extra dimensional or supernatural forces to figure something out it's going to take us time you know the, the, there's so something speak about with this so speak with dead we, we're definitely going to talk about speak with dead but yeah that could be one right like we've got to take this f- corpse back <laughs> and like talk to it and that's going to take a while right because we don't just want to do it here the killer might still be watching you know uh and so the the big thing with forensic is is it requires specialized knowledge and time, and and that might mm-hmm. not be something that the players have, so it's something that they can rope in an NPC, one of their contacts, something like that. For uh, there's also serendipitous clues. Not only is it obvious, but it literally falls into their lap. You know, this oh, yeah. is one of those <laughs> this is one of those things that you can help out your players, if they're really floundering that, you know, they, and they want to stay in the game, right? Like they're not like thrown in the towel and be like, this is stupid. Let's play something else. But like, they would like to continue. They're having trouble, like, you know, just putting pieces together or, or finding enough p- pieces to begin with. Like you can just go, this piece of vital information kind of falls in your lap. And the trick there is like, not, bring them out of that moment too much. Like if you can align the serendipity with something that's happening in game, you know, then, then that's all the better. But in like detective stories and mysteries and the like, there's all kinds of like, Oh yeah, we wouldn't have found it if the killer hadn't made this mistake in front of us or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that. We got lucky. 
that's where this comes in. Or say the uh, say that NPC that you roped in to do the forensic thing, he go they go off and do that. And while you're floundering, they come back like, by the way, there was this particular type of water, which is only found in the bog west of town. Lo and behold, you have a new clue. You have a new direction, a new lead in the case. Uh, and finally, there's um, in testimonials, interviews with people of interest, persons of interest. These require some sort of independent verification, like you shouldn't just take a creature at their word. But in a fantasy game, you got a lot of options there can detect their thoughts, their zone of truth, their divinations. Oh, yeah. And so, like, <laughs> it becomes a more legitimate source of, of gather, you know, information gathering and finding clues because you have those ways to verify it. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's one thing when you can, like, you know, disguise yourself as a, as a suspect's, like, most trusted friend and then read their mind while they talk to you at the same time, you know? Like, that's a... Yeah, that could be a very interesting, uh, you know, scene to play through uh, on that t kind of piggybacking on that. I'm imagining a good cop, bad cop scene where it's the cleric casting zone of truth going. We just need to talk. And you, yeah. do you really want this wizard to, to, to read your mind? Like, I don't want that. I just want us to have a conversation and you can totally yes. good cop, bad cop with a with a cleric and a, and a wizard. Yes. Yeah, I um, love that. <laughs> I love good cop, bad cop scenes. Oh, certainly. Yeah, and that's a great setup for like a fantasy one. And that also leans into the magic that your fantasy investigators would want to use in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, I, I've, I have a lot of fun with these. I think that knowing the type of clue and the information you want that clue to convey is like just a great CYA for, for DMs. You want to make sure what you're, the information you're giving them is useful. They can use it to make uh, you know decisions and, and piece together what's going on. And so knowing from behind the scenes, okay, this is what type it is. This is going to be you know forensic. It's going to require specialized uh, information and time, and it's going to tell them you know the method, how the how of it, you know. But then if they go to a cryptic clue, it's going to tell them like when. Or, or, or where or something like that. You can double up. Things can be, like you said, you know, uh, obvious once it, or serendipitous once it's, you know, found through forensic means. Maybe it tells you a bunch of information. But it kind of helps you just organize your information. Key here. Uh, in, the, in, a, <laughs> in a scenario where the uncovering of information is the point, you want that information organized. Let's say that you are, uh, you know, that you are open to failure that the idea that the players could fail to find something sounds interesting to you and it does to me as a player um then you want to just be prepared for it right like what we don't want is for there to be failure and the dungeon master has no idea what's going to happen right like th that's and that's applies to just about anything where you're rolling the dice, but in investigation, especially because they're so susceptible to a failed die roll, just stalling everything out. Um, you just think about it. Even if in that moment when the player's like, can I use this skill? Can I do this thing? Before you ask them to roll, just pause the game. Give me a minute. I need to think about this. Take your time. State up front not the exact consequences of the failure, but give them a hint or an idea of what the consequences would be. If you don't find this, you know, you might be missing out on something vital, but it's not going to completely shut things down. You know, it, it is still going to, you know, give you some information, but it'll give you information in a sense of like, okay, we shouldn't follow these leads, that sort of thing. What you're doing then as a dungeon master is... <clears throat> letting the players know that it's worth taking this risk that regardless of the outcome they will get something they can use even if it's not exactly what they want so being comfortable with failure understanding that that it, sometimes it's okay uh, especially for players and, and and this might take a while uh you know if it's going to happen at all for players to become more you know risk tolerant and, and accepting that failure is a legitimate outcome of their attempted actions. Um, for a lot of players, that's not what they want. And so 
you know, that that's kind of one of those session zero before we start this scenario kind of things. But um, letting them know in that moment that if they fail, it's going to be okay. Um, because even if we're rolling and the, the, the possibility of failure is, is on the table, we want to avoid a bottleneck. We want to avoid like, okay, well, what do we do now? <laughs> like, can we go play in a dungeon, please? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When the DM goes, so, oh. <laughs> geez. So um, making sure you're thinking in alternatives and avenues of approach. And because you've set this up ahead of time, you know what clues there are, what information they convey. you got your checklists, your timelines, your layout, all that other stuff. You can be certain when you're crafting the scenario that there is not just one way to approach it. And you can say with confidence to the players, this didn't work out for you. I'm not going to say anything else, but there are other ways to approach this. And this is a prompt for the players to like return to the drawing board, re-examine what they have, and see like maybe that guess or that, you know, hunch that we had isn't quite working. And this might be a place to throw in a serendipitous clue to give them a little bit extra, you know? Someone mm -hmm. who is involved in the mystery feels guilt and approaches the investigators, that kind of thing. Um, that's a different, that's a way to provide alternatives. What happens if all the alternatives don't, don't work out? What if, what if they just miss the clues and... What, what, how do you what's what eventuality how do you prepare for that eventuality that's the better question sure i mean ultimately this is something to do while you're prepping your scenario what happens if the players fail to find any like not just find a fail fail to find them geez um but that they don't draw the right conclusions or they're too late something like that then just being comfortable with saying yeah they got away with it like they did. The killer's still free. The the eldritch horror was summoned. The you know the crooked politician did, you know is now in power, uh, or something like that. Mm. And mm. again, understanding that that doesn't have to <laughs> that that doesn't have to end the game. That the game continues onward, and that that might set up the next scenario where we move from investigation to something else. You, you yeah. might be go from investigators to conspirators, you know, <laughs> as you start setting up mm -hmm. your own, uh, you know, undercover, undesirable uh, operation. So just considering it, like not ruling it off the table, not going, oh, this won't happen, or how could they possibly fail, all that kind of stuff. But like, nope, they can. The dice will betray you. They are betrayers. Uh, they're they're traitors. They're bastards. Do not trust them. But They're sirens in the night calling really you are. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> uh, so just be you ready. Drown in and, a sea of ones. <laughs> right. And if you Sorry. don't want to deal with any of this, then the gumshoe method of are they in the right place at the right time asking the right questions, they will find it. Then the challenge is yeah. not did we find the clue, but did we put it together and piece it together with the others? Do we understand the significance of it? And like I said, the gumshoe way is very enjoyable from an investigation playing through its scenario, but it is a different experience, you know. The big one. Yeah. The big one of avoiding speculation. This will mm. kill an investigation, right? This will cause the players to just burn themselves out and the DM to pull their hair out in frustration as they take a you know, an errant clue and, and misinterpret it, or they've got lots of clues and they don't quite know how to put them together. And these situations happen when there are multiple conclusions that they could come to that suggest multiple resolutions. When it looks like two people could have done this or that it's the conspirators or this other thing. And those moments as a DM, sometimes you can use them to, to like draw in the player speculation to help build, you know, what you're going to do next. And in most cases, that's a useful tool for you as a, a game referee. But in this kind of thing, when you've got a, no, this, this is the person that did it. This is how they did it. You guys are wrong. <laughs> what they're telling you at that moment, whether they know it or not, is that they don't have enough information. And mm -hmm. I think that it's certainly 
perfectly acceptable as a dungeon master to go, sounds like you guys don't know enough yet. Is there another place you could go to find information? Or is, is there a lead you haven't followed up on? And if right. the answer to that is no, we looked over everything and it doesn't look like there is, then somewhere along the line there was information you either didn't get to them or they missed and, and you missed that they missed it. And getting them back to a point where they feel like they're in control, that they know where they're going and how they're going to get there. Um, that's what, again, serendipitous clues are for. <laughs> that it just uh, happens to uh -huh. be there, right? You know? <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah. sometimes uh, because it is D&D &D that we're talking about here mostly, yeah. Um, and there is magic and uh, gods and everything. You can create your own serendipity a little bit. Certainly. Yes. Mm -hmm.